Hello booktube! This is Brecky from Brecky Writes, this is Brecky Reads, and this is my May wrap-up video. So May was a good reading month overall, but I definitely hit a slump towards the second half of the month. I participated in two readathons in the first two weeks, Ribsat, Read Your Bookshelf-a-thon, and Book buddy a thon so I was able to read a bunch of books, I think like eight books in the first two weeks of May, and then I read like five books in the second two weeks of May, so I slowed down a lot. May is also the first month where I reread a book that I've read before. That's one of my bad habits when I get stressed out is I go to books that I've read before because they're comforting. I don't know if I'm the only person that does that, but I definitely did that this month. The first book I actually finished in the month of May was not a part of either of my readathons. This was an audiobook that I listened to and it was called No Lands Man by Asif Manvi. Asif Manvi is is known for being on The Daily Show. He was the first Muslim correspondent and I knew him from The Daily Show and I thought he was really funny. When it came up on my Audible that I could get his memoir, I was like, oh great, this would be awesome. I hated this book. I gave it two out of five stars and the only reason I didn't DNF it was because it was only a four hour long audiobook. Basically this was billed as a comedy memoir and I expected it to be as funny as he was on The Daily Show and it wasn't funny at all. And it wasn't even poignant. Like okay if it's not gonna be funny it needs to give me feels and make me feel really connected to him and understand his life. He is a South Asian actor trying to break into an industry that is terribly discriminatory. There were two chapters that I really enjoyed but everything else I thought was not well written and he was terribly misogynistic. Every single female he describes in this book with the exception of his mother and his sister he talks about in explicitly sexual terms. Every girl he knows when he's growing up in school, every celebrity, everything that he does when he talks about women is purely in sexual terms and that's just not funny nor appealing nor appropriate so I hated this. Then I jumped into Ribset, Read Your bookshelf a -thon. I'm not gonna go into super detail about each of the books I read because I've already wrapped them up. So the first one was Lola and the Boy Next Door. This is the second in the companion series by Stephanie Perkins that begins with Anne and the French Kiss. I adored this and gave this four out of five stars. Then I read my favorite book of the whole month, Six of Crows by Leigh Bardugo. This was a five out of five star read. I loved it. You can see it's tabbed. Not only is this in my Ribsat wrap up, but I also did a book chat. It is full of spoilers, so please be warned about that. But I loved this. I think I enjoyed this more than the Grisha trilogy, and that is saying something. The last book I read for Ribsat was Isla and the Happily Ever After. This finishes the companion trilogy by Stephanie Perkins, and I did enjoy this. This book made me cry. It really did, and I gave it four out of five stars. And I was barely finished with Ribsat when it was time to jump into Book buddy a -thon. Like with Ribsat, I've already reviewed the books that I read, so I will link that down in the description. The first one I read was Boy Snowbird by Helen Oyayemi. This was a highly anticipated book that fell completely flat for me. I did give this three out of five stars, but this put me in a bit of a book slump that you will see for the rest of the month. Alright, the next book I read for Book buddy -thon was A Discovery of Witches by Deborah Harkness. This is my first reread of the year. I love this book. I gave this 4.5 out of 5 stars. I've upgraded it because I have read this like three times and I love it. Then I read the second book in this series, Shadow of Night, also by Deborah Harkness, and this I also gave 4.5 stars to. Shadow of Night and Discovery of Witches are about a professor named Diana Bishop who is a witch and a researcher named Matthew Claremont who is a vampire, their love story, their escapades. This is the one where they meet and they are hunting down a medieval manuscript that may hold the key to the knowledge of the universe and this book is where they travel back in time and I loved it. And that was the end of Book buddy -a -thon. I then finished the trilogy and read The Book of Life, the last in the All Souls trilogy by Deborah Harkness. I gave this only four out of five stars. There is a lot of discussion of an ill that Matthew the vampire love interest has that I think it's a little bit tiresome. The big battle scene is a little bit anticlimactic, but I do think that there's a lot of good in this book. You get to see more of the mysterious congregation that is the big bad sort of looming throughout the first two books, and you get a lot more of vampire history and culture. You get to know a lot more about Matthew's family and his son Marcus and Gallo Glass, and just all of the characters get more fleshed out in this, so I really did enjoy it, but I don't think it was as 
as good as the other two, but still, a solid trilogy. You won't be disappointed, I loved it even upon rereading. Then I finished the audiobook of A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Engel. This is the classic children's fantasy that follows the Murray children as they try to save their father from it, the great darkness that is on another planet. All of my friends who read this as children love this book. I have been told for years, probably since I was about 12 years old, I should read A Wrinkle in Time. And I thought, great, I'll check it out from my library, listen to it as an audiobook. I had plans to read the entire quintet, and I hated it! I did. I hated A Wrinkle in Time. I think that this is a clear indicator of sometimes there really are ages where books are going to be best. I missed this window. I felt like the whole plot was completely illogical. They moved from scene to scene in completely illogical ways, ways that people do not act in real life, and it made no sense. The characters were super flat. It was just so ridiculous, and I wanted to love it. I was like, this will be right in my wheelhouse. It's fantasy, it's children's fantasy, it's a classic, it's about the problem of evil and where does evil come from. It also asks questions of ultimate concern, veiled with religious imagery and language, like I am here for all of those things. I just feel kind of disappointed that I didn't love it because I wanted to, I planned to, I went in with such high expectations and I just was so disappointed. This is really the month of disappointing reads because I also really wanted to love Boy Snowbird and I didn't, yeah disappointing reads. So after A Wrinkle in Time, I finished another audiobook. I kind of switched gears, went totally in a different direction, and I listened to The Nerdist Way by Chris Hardwick. Now Chris Hardwick is known for writing The Nerdist Podcast and kind of Nerdist Industries. He's a man about the internet. I think he's really funny. I used to follow The Nerdist Podcast pretty closely, so I gave The Nerdist Way a 3 out of 5 stars. Again, I wrongly assumed that this would be more of a memoir. It's definitely not a memoir. It's a self-help book for nerds, and when this came out back in 2011, I think it was probably on the cusp of the wave that we now have of like how to live your best nerdy life. It's sort of general life advice, which is fine. It is funny, however, and I will say in that respect it did not disappoint. It was funny, he does tell stories about his life and how he hit rock bottom and climbed back up again, and how he really is a nerd, like he was in chess club all through middle and high school. I was only in chess club in elementary and middle school, so there you go. He clearly has some nerd cred. All right, so this is the point of the month where my entire life exploded and I was just coming home and wanting to read but like not willing to commit to something new. And I picked up The Kind Diet. This is my copy of The Kind Diet by Alicia Silverstone. I used to be a vegan. I was vegan for a year and a half. I'm currently a vegetarian. And part of my reason for being a vegan is I greatly disagree with the meat and dairy industry. They are terrible for the animals involved, obviously, but they're also really, really bad for the environment and also for the humans who have to work in those conditions. I could go on a whole rant about this, but I won't. One of the benefits of The Kind Diet is that Alicia Silverstone talks about some of these problems and it's a really accessible look at environmentalism and why she's a vegan and what's good about veganism and especially a conversation about sugar which I think benefits everybody. Here's the problem with the kind diet and this is the reason it's only a three star read. It is so full of privileged nonsense that it's almost useless to everyday Americans. Like she needs us to get some kind of weird plum sauce and weird vinegars and truffle oils and things that are both expensive and hard to find. The privilege that you would need Need to afford and find some of these recipe items is just obscene. And she doesn't make any lists of alternatives in case you can't get your hands on them. I know I'm kind of ranty about it. I do like some of the recipes, but this is one I would say don't buy. It's a three star read. It's worth checking out from the library if you're interested in veganism or vegetarian eating, but don't invest. After I finished The Kind Diet, I was able to listen to an audiobook, and that is the classic children's story, The Wizard of Oz. This is technically a reread for me. My mother read me the entire Wizard of Oz series when I was a little girl. This is a really long series. There are like 15 books in The Wizard of Oz series. And all these books are also allegories. The Wizard of Oz actually is a whole conversation about the gold and silver issue right around the turn of the 20th century. And one of the big differences between the book and the movie is that Dorothy's shoes are actually 
actually silver and not ruby. They made them ruby slippers in order to enhance the color because it was one of the first color films to come out and silver shoes wouldn't have shown up the same way that ruby slippers would have. However, in the book, her shoes are silver because Frank L. Baum was a proponent of the silver issue, which means he wanted to back American money with gold and silver, which never ended up happening. So in order to talk about the gold and silver issue, we had a yellow brick road, gold, and we had the silver slippers. I will put a link to a whole website discussing the allegorical details of Wizard of Oz down in the description. It is very different from the film. Very, very different. More violent, actually. I gave the children's book four out of five stars, but I listened to the Audible production that had Anne Hathaway reading it, and it was fantastic. She Meryl Streeped the heck out of this book, right? Like, it was so good. She did all the accents and all these different voices. It was so good. Five star good. And the final book that I finished in the month of May was Food Matters by Mark Bittman. Now this also was a reread, although it's been a long time since I picked this up. Mark Bittman is probably best well known for his food writing. I think he writes for the New York Times and he's also written The Omnivore's Dilemma. Now he chooses to continue to eat meat, I don't, but I think that this book is a really refreshing read after all of the sort of fad diets and pseudoscience. Basically he's like, part of the problem is most people don't know how to cook and they don't know how to do any kind of basic food prep so they eat a lot of processed stuff that has way too much bad junk in it so here is why that stuff is bad junk and also here's how you can you know cook as someone who did not grow up cooking this was a great little overview of sort of the science behind cooking without being too heavy or too dense it's very readable it's really quite short it has a lot of great recipes this again is for omnivores, so if you are looking for something strictly vegetarian, you will miss out here. He does say a little bit of meat eating is fine, but I still think it's a good read. And if you are somebody who's trying to understand the environmental impact of how you're eating, this is a good book because it's not just about lowering your meat consumption, it's about thinking about where your vegetables come from and eating in season and how you make your own grains and those sorts of things that get left out of a lot of the fad diet conversations. I got a lot out of this and I gave it four out of five stars. And there we have it, my friends. Those are the 13 books that I read in the month of May. With my May reading, I have read 63 books in five months. That is bonkers. You guys should let me know what your favorite book of the month was. Mine was very clearly Six of Crows by Leigh Bardugo. This was far and away my favorite book. Thank you all for watching and I will talk to you soon. Bye!